we are recording. Welcome to the weekly In Web Browsers and IPFS GUI Team Sync call. I will be your host for today. Um, we have an agenda, but first off, we will do a round of what highlight was most exciting from my week last week and what I hope to achieve next week. Uh, and we will go roughly in document order. So, da -da -da -da, as is customary, Lydal, could you give us your highlight from last week? Okay, that's, that's the highlight. So I changed my wallpaper. Yes, <laughs> it's really good. And uh, no, that's not the highlight. This is the highlight, I think. Is it? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've been working on IPFS Companion and uh, implemented some stuff. Details are here, but basically the product of that is a new beta release with uh, context actions enabled on the NSLink sites. And those sites do not need to be loaded from your local gateway. You may disable gateway redirect in IPFS Companion and you still will get those uh, context actions. And we also, uh, the visual refresh continues. So we tweaked a little bit the way the toggles work and added those toggles to preferences screen and some other small tweaks if you want to uh, provide some thoughts on how we should move forward with this. There's a link to the discussion uh, issue. And if you want to provide translations, there's a link to the place at Transifix when you can provide them. This is a beta release, so you need to opt in uh, to the beta channel. And I have it installed uh, here. So, wow, let me quickly, yeah. Uh, I have installed it here, so, uh, Multiformats website uh, is at multiformats.io and it's a DNS link website. And you can see it's loaded from my local gateway, but using this new uh, uh, interface in IPFS Companion, I'm able to disable redirect on this one website. And you see it switched back to the original uh, host name and still you are able to copy on the European uh, this website or a specific, like a specific resource. Uh, as well, and you can also switch back. So that's the update. Uh, I also um, got back to uh, Brave and uh, solved all the issues that prevented JSAPFS from starting in Brave uh, context, web extension context with more powerful APIs. And uh, more on that, maybe later but basically we are unblocked and my plan for the next week is to uh, add missing wi uh, wiring uh, to enable starting uh, HTTP API and gateway in web browser right now it's only possible to start it uh, when you start uh, JSIPFS D1 from the command line uh, so that's my update very cool any questions for Lido? No, okay. Um, Enrique, I think this call is still not a good time for him, so I will give his highlight based on an element from his list of my choosing. Um, I think the most exciting thing that he has been working on, let me share my screen. Da -da -da -da. Uh, he's been working on IPFS desktop, and the most significant one is working on the menu bar to make it simpler. Um, I think the entire GUI team, almost the entire GUI team, is engaged in this bike shed now. Um, but the gist of it is that the desktop app had an unjustifiably gratuitous UI just to show a menu, and it also had positioning issues on multi-screen setups. So eventually the question was asked, why isn't this just a context menu? Um, so this is not super thrilling, but it, this, is a, this is not the final version, but uh, the menu is now much simpler, but still performs the same, same functions. Anyway, uh, he is deep in that. If you have opinions on how that should look, uh, this is the, the current iteration. 
um, giving you quick access to restarting and stopping the node, uh, and then hiding most of the other stuff behind an advanced menu, uh, and links to the desktop UI status files and settings tabs. Uh, so they do what you would expect. So if you click on status, it brings up the desktop UI. Very exciting. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, he has also been pushing forward the IP this desktop 0.7 release, and the only blockers to that now are merging in the improved analytics UI and upgrading the Go IPFS dependency to 0.4.19. So it looks like we could cut a release of that after this call, which is pretty exciting because it's been way longer than we expected it would be, but it's nearly ready. So uh, that segues quite nicely to the big news from me. Well, my highlight from last week was, oh my goodness, it's been a quarter in the works. There was a load of work done on it in January and then waiting for our analytics service to be available. And then I thought it was done and then I was told that it was not done, and so I did even more work. And now, ba -ba 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 -ba, the analytics for the web UI is done. Everyone said that they liked it, so I have merged it in. Um, this GIF shows you how it works, but who wants GIFs when we've now got exciting IPFS previews on the things? So the pull request has the preview build on it. So as a new user, what you see is an ask on the home page on the first time you visit. If you've not decided how you feel about analytics, then there's an invitation to help us out. And you might say okay, or you might say no thanks. If you're really interested, you might say more info. Uh, and the more info takes you to uh, a trimmed down version of the settings page that explains more clearly what's going on. Uh, I just did some last minute tweaks based on, so this was Lytle's idea that made like the most sense based on showing the user the more info and then Chris gave me some feedback on just tidying up the checkbox and I think a bunch of people had said why is it in a white box and so I know that uh, Diego said that as well so I eventually capitulated. Uh, so you get a kind of bit of an introduction and then if you're on the settings page that would be collapsed by default but because you asked for more info we open it up uh, and then you can drill down and so we then break it down by type. So you might be interested in exactly what we're tracking. If you're technical, this will make, it tries to get sort of, um, to do a good job of hiding details at every level. So giving you a kind of like the level of granularity that you can deal with. Um, and it tries to explain it in a sensible language at each level until you drill down all the way and then it gets quite technical and it tries to be very specific and very transparent so that if you are technical that you can see exactly what's happening and the feedback I've got from this is that this makes people feel much more uh, it may, Maybe it won't make anyone else tick the box, but it makes them feel like We're being as transparent as we can about what data that we are recording um, so that includes for like a, a browser session that'll include app metrics like your user agent and your screen resolution and do your browser locale. Uh, so we unpack the query params there so they're a bit easier to read because trying to, trying to interpret this from the URL is pretty difficult. Uh, and then as the icing on the cake, we also provide a view source link that takes you to the relevant chunk of the library that we use so you can see exactly how it goes about recording your browser metric. Um, and then we do that job for each section. So events. Uh, these are the specific Redux actions that we have bound into the uh, analytics. So what's nice is that that list is being driven from the code. So I, I export that list from the place where it's used and I then consume it from this documentation section. So that those two things will always be in sync. Um, what else is nice? Uh, if you check help us improve it checks all these four safe ones um, but the app errors one is not considered safe because we can it, it's very difficult for us to guarantee that an error message uh, or stack trace will never contain a CID or a file path within your local NFS or other personally identifiable information um, and we explain that here 
Um, so checking the top level one doesn't automatically opt you into app errors. The chances of anyone specifically opting into app errors seems vanishingly low at this point, but it has a, an ancillary value in that if people open issues and they're particularly difficult for us to recreate, we can ask them to go and enable this feature and then we will start to see their error messages appearing in our analytics tool, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and also the way the logic of this tick box is uh, if you you tick any of these things, then the top level one is ticked. If you untick all of the types, then that's equivalent to turning off analytics. There's no there's no extra surprises. These are all the things that can be tracked and you either are in or out. Anyway, it's in, it's merged. Ha ha, I don't have to think about analytics for like a week now. Uh, he says deep down knowing that this is just the beginning. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, my other highlight of just now was I got a GitHub action working and what does it do? Well, it does the thing that I already figured out, which is how to pin pin websites to IPFS cluster from uh, from CI. Uh, that's not what I wanted to click on. Uh, yeah, we've got a GitHub action for IPFS now. It's it's early days, but what it does is lets you. That's a good link. Yeah, an example workflow. So you can then use it from the GitHub Actions tab on your site. So this is the IPLD website. And I've configured a GitHub workflow that involves building the site. So I just have to, the way this works is uh, you can create new, I mean, one fight at a time. You, you'd say, I want to create a new workflow. You then define the steps and uh, the actions within that workflow. So the first one is a builder. So our website build process depends on NPM. So I'm using the pre-built GitHub action for NPM. Um, and it, it has already checked out our code into a Docker image. And that Docker image has NPM and Node available. Um, the build for this particular site happens to use make. So I just configured it to run the make action, uh, run the make command within a Docker container. Uh, when it's done, it then passes off to a second container this workspace is, is persisted between containers. So the next one has the output of the checked out code plus the result of running make. Uh, so then this second one just runs uh, a script to pin the contents of the public directory, which is where the build process pumps the value up to uh, and pins it to cluster. So you get a similar situation to the setup that we're trying with CircleCI. And you can see that there's a preview PR, and you get this nice IPFS website added to IPFS, and same 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 as if as the circle setup, it takes you to a preview IPFS CID that was the result of building in the GitHub action, which is nice. Um, I'm I'm looking for a neat way of separating out. We want to get these website previews on every single PR regardless of contributor, like whether there is from a fork, an external contributor, or from a member. But we need to then be able to separate our secrets. So the secrets that let you pin stuff to a cluster are less deeply important than the secrets that control the DNS for the domain. Um, we don't want to leak any of them, but we do also want to have a good user experience for contributors. So there's still some work to do there, but that's what I've been looking at. Question from Eric. So is the use case for this, uh, it makes preview links for a site that I'm updating or creating? The, the use case is like anyone should be able to submit, anyone can submit a PR to our websites and say, here, I fixed a thing or I added a new idea. And we want, this feature is really useful for, for reviewers to be able to like, let me just see the results of that build without having to check it out locally and build it. Um, but the problem we have right now is with the circle one. The current, the current setup is uh, uh, people who are not already part of the organization, the GitHub org, uh, their pull requests come from external forks and we turn off continuous integration on those builds, which is draconian but is also the only way to guarantee that we won't leak the uh, secrets, secret tokens for like DNS and cluster username and password 
it, it would be possible to craft a malicious pull request to expose those secrets. Um, so right now we just arbitrarily trust people inside the org and arbitrarily do not trust people outside the org. Um, and I'd like to find a solution for that that is less horrible. So that's what I've been researching. Anyway, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you for listening. I uh, have been engaged in this IPFS desktop proposal and I'm going to be looking at uh, IPFS desktop 0.7 release after this call. And then I'm on to making a proposal for the new web UI peers page. Because uh, right now it's just a map and it doesn't do enough to justify its existence. And IPFS has lots of API surface area that is involved with connecting to arbitrary peers and we should surface that in the UI. Uh, and then I'm going to help out with the help system. And that's me for next week. <sighs> um, Diogo, how's it going? I will stop my screen share. Do you want to share with us a thing? Yeah. How's everyone? Yeah, good. Cool. So last week, what I've been doing, I've been kind of finishing the help system on the web UI. I've created a Google Doc so everyone can chime in with their opinions, ideas. I would appreciate feedback on what, what are we trying to achieve with this help system. And I've put uh, some GIFs uh, of what already is made so you guys can see and make your suggestions. Basically, I've made uh, a guided tour for every page except the peers page. No, uh, sorry, except the explore page because this is from, um, this is plugging in from another uh, repo. So I have to, to see how I'm going to, to do this. So yeah, uh, what I have right now is we, we come to a certain page. We have this little uh, question mark that we can click and it starts the guided tour. And you just, just make the tour or you just, or you can cancel it. I'm going to, to implement a suggestion from Eric that uh, when you first enter a page, you'll have like this tooltip saying, hey, you, you have the guided tours here if you want to see them. This is not implemented, but I think this is a, a nice way because when a new user enters a page and just this check mark doesn't, it isn't too, uh, too obvious. So having that tooltip the first time, I think it's good. And then when the user closes it, it won't uh, happen again. Uh, apart from that, I've been, uh, yeah, the help system, the, the document, I've upgraded the web UI to use Create React App uh, 2. That was, that was the thing that we, we already made, uh, only made it on the IPLD Explorer and web UI was needing it too. Basically, it allows, it does a bunch of things to, to web UI, it makes it fast, and we don't have to mess with the webpack config. That's super great because uh, we have an ejected config, so everything works in the Create React App version one. With version two, we just use the plain config that it comes with. So that's pretty cool. And uh, I basically I made that because to upgrade to Storybook uh, five, the newer version, the shiny version of Storybook, we needed to have the latest version of the Create React app. So I've been working on those two. It's an open pull request. It's finished. Uh, I made uh, both in one pull request because upgrading to Storybook five, having the Create React app version two was just uh, so easy. So here it is. It's, it's waiting for a um, for a review, and that's about it. Uh, this next this week, uh, Thursday and Friday, I'll be off. But next week, I'm hoping to finish the Web UI help system. I, I would really appreciate if you guys uh, put some feedback. If not, it will go as is. But the copy needs some um, some eyes because can it's you, very very basic. Can you drop the link to that doc in the chat? Uh, yeah, sure. Have you guys have any question? All good. I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, shiny new Storybook 5 interface. I hear it's very shiny. Yeah, I like it a lot. And I think it's, uh, it's better with add-ons. And the thing I'm most uh, happy about is I think we can create new hierarchies because right now on the Storybook we were using, 
you could have just one hierarchy. For example, files page, and inside the files page, you just have uh, components. And now you have uh, can have files page, then buttons, and then inside buttons, uh, all the buttons that you want. And that's cool. It may not seem much, but it's uh, it's nice. Super cool. Um, all right. Hugo, Mr. Diaz, you want to share a thing? Yes, let's share things. So uh, I've been working on the lock stuff on IPFS. Uh, this is related to a dependency that we use, the proper lock file. Uh, we were, were having issues when we when I, like you run a daemon and your system slips or um, the um, JavaScript event loop it's too busy to run the timers and basically the the proper log file would just throw because it couldn't like update the lock in time. Uh, we implement I implemented a workaround. Not like a workaround, but a proper fix to this. It was released, and we are now bubbling up um, this dependency. Um, IPFS repo is already merged and released, so now it, we're just missing the just uh, JS IPFS. I also um, went into the view rabbit hole. Uh, and I can say that uh, it's a deep hole, black hole. Uh, so my initial thought was uh, not uh, the solution. Um, and right now I'm still digging into it and finding uh, all the problems and stuff. Um, the proto school repo has some uh, dependencies updated, uh, and because of it, I was I, I had too much too much of a surface to like test view. Right now, I'm just uh, testing it into with a clean um, view CLI um, uh, init or create or whatever command they have uh, clean repo, uh, and it's and it's been much easier to debug stuff. Um, basically, view config or webpack config that view uses is much strictier than create React app, and we have a lot of pro problems uh, with our exports because in the app you will probably mix uh, AS modules uh, with common common JS at least from JSAPFS because we don't have a ES module version. And the way we do exports uh, makes Vue uh, crash and fail and not, it's not able to build. So there is other problems, uh, set immediate problems that we uh, use but don't have a, an explicit require. Uh, I had in one repo, at least, I already made a pull request. I'm waiting for it to be merged and released. And I will keep digging into it until I, uh, I find a proper way to make Product School um, work um, 100%. Holly? Just on that, I, I hit a lot of those issues before I gave up and just used the pre built browser friendly bundle. With the set immediate one, uh, there's you can add a static config line that just says uh, web config node set immediate. Like you can have it transpile in for IPFS. That that was one that I did manage to fix. Yeah, yeah, I already did that, so I was able to go into the next problem. Okay. Uh, so it's a step by step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that that specific issue, not obviously yeah. like locker, but yeah. yeah, it's yeah. I think I got like three like whack a moles in. I was like, oh, that one's fixed. Now the next era, oh, no. yeah. uh, I got three in, and I was like, nah, done. Step yeah, on. but uh, I I think we we should aim to achieve like we did for create React app, 
as Diogo said, uh, that now you are just able to use it default, the default config and not like eject nothing. We should aim to do the same for, for at least you. Um, I'm starting to feel that there should be an explicit IPFS for the browser, IPFS light. That's yeah. A separate, that's a separate beast. Yes, yes, yes. Let, let, let's just finish the, the bundle size and this the view stuff. Uh, I'll get there. I'll get there step by step. Nice. Yeah. So, sorry. I thought I just heard you say something about having a PR ready to merge. You meant something that's not in my repo, right? I'm not holding you up. Oh, no, no. Uh, okay. okay. It's in another repo. Um, still uh, ready to go to school. When I finished with uh, uh, the, the clean repo, we will probably need to make some changes to the Proto School repo because there's weird stuff going on there. Because when I changed to a clean one, it was much easier to understand what, where the errors come, came from. So we'll figure that out. Uh, so I also um, introduced back the Windows testing on JS uh, lib P2P because we are we're having issues with um, with Travis and right now we just have an uh, like an ADOC uh, set up using Azure pipelines just for that repo just running Windows so it's just a temporary solution until we figure out uh, a better way to do it and that's it for the rest of the week I will continue the bundle size the view support stuff and the sync it rips. Very cool. Any questions? Okay, Terry, did you want to share a thing? Yeah, I did remember what I've been doing that made me not do anything else, which is I found a location for offline camp and we booked it. So if anyone's super curious, you can go in the event management private repo to learn more. Still top secret. Don't tell any outside people. Thank you. This, this is a recorded public call that I think goes on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> offline camp may or may not be happening soon. Um, so in proto school, the last thing I did on the file uh, API tutorial was to get myself really confused because I <laughs> tried to make the user practice using add, and then I tried to like verify it that they'd done the right thing by using something that was MFS that didn't work. Um, and part of this is stemming from the fact that some people think we should have a lesson about the non MFS things like add and get with files. And some people, <coughs> Michael, think we shouldn't do it at all and we should only do MFS. So he was proposing verification methods thinking I was doing different content than I was at the time and I didn't catch it. I also, as is evidenced by my the text on the website, I don't have quite a full enough understanding to give a great uh, description of stuff that's happening. I'm trying to get this window over to where I can share it, but I'm failing. So in the documentation for add, it says that data can be a buffer instance, a readable stream, a pull stream, or an array of objects. And what I don't know is, which of those I'm using if I pass in a file object that was gotten by using the thing you use to choose a file in the browser or the drag and drop. Is, is, does it match to one of those things? Like when you just use the selector on your computer to pick a file, what kind of data object is it? It's a, a, a file object as represented by, like it's a DOM file object. It's, it's none of those things explicitly unless you wrap it in something else. Why does it work? Good question. Because what I was trying to do was say, hey, you can put, you can, in the text of the lesson, I was trying to say, hey, you can do this with it in any of these ways. Here's an example of doing it with this thing. The thing you just uploaded happens to be this kind, so it works. But I can't say that if it's not a thing on the list. I don't know what to say. Um, yeah, so I'm just at this point with where like the functionality exists to get files into work with, but I need to 
figure out how I'm structuring those lessons. And if I am going ahead and explaining the add and get kinds of things that people think are less than ideal, but won't be changed soon. And then separately explaining MFS and the differences between them or just skipping and only explaining MFS and ignoring all the rest of the confusion. Hmm. It has seemed to me like the majority of people think I should do the add and get stuff. Is that true on this call? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I okay. think, I think to not do it without a plan to deprecate, add and remove, or somehow unify. Like we don't have the vision of unifying add and get with the MFS world. And until we have that, pretending like okay. they don't exist isn't gonna right. get us very far. This I would rather yeah. Yeah, give a decent explanation. Um, and I think it's also helpful to be able to present something that feels similar to what you just learned with the DAG API. Um, so I'm continuing down that path. And then the other link that I popped in the notes is to me trying to work on the roadmap for Proto School. If people on this call don't know, in theory, at least as of next quarter, Proto School will be a top level project as opposed to sitting under IPFS. Um, and we need a real actual roadmap and OKRs and whatever. So I'm looking for suggestions on what we can do to support this team and the other IPFS teams and the other project teams in educational goals. So as you go into your OKR process and whatever else, please drop in ideas about what we can do in Proto School that would be helpful. Um, and that will also, in theory, as a project, there may be some budget involved potentially for hiring, but what makes sense in terms of people who live in project teams contributing with editorial help versus hiring someone who's just building content across all the projects, whatever, is something we can talk about after we have those ideas flowing. I think that's it for me. That's super cool. Um, on, on the like, what, why did it work file advert from the file input? Um, I know in WebUI, we definitely wrap the output of a file input in a converter that converts it to a readable stream. Um, so it'd be interesting, like, but we can go through this in a pull request, like we can do it offline, but yeah, it'd be, I mean, maybe it just works now. Maybe there's a browser. browser or maybe shoot. Michael did something that I didn't notice to it yeah, already yeah. when he built the functionality. Yeah, wow. it's quite likely that he's wrapping the output of that in some kind of file reader interface. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, next on the list is Eric. He's listed no things, so it's a mystery. Eric, have you got anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I did not really know what this meeting was. <coughs> Although I, it, it was documented, so I have really no excuse. Uh, I've been uh, uh, sick. Uh, there was that, uh, which is abating. Uh, and let's see, I've been wrapping my head around uh, protocol labs and, and what it uh, is trying to get my bearings. And one of the things I'm, I want to do is um, pitch in with Filecoin uh, in, in the effort for developing a brand guidebook or a, a brand reference of some kind that, that folks could use to... Um, you know, to build stuff so that they don't have to solve, you know, visual problems. They don't have to think about problems they don't want to think about. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and also to help with consistency, right? Uh, to make like the best thing to create also the easiest thing to create, you know, because it's been done before. Uh, and yes, yeah, right now it's, 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 you know, it's, it's nowhere, uh, it's not there yet. But you know, there's a lot of stuff out there for Filecoin, for example. So visual inventory is kind of just trying to grab uh, whatever there is, and uh, you know, some of the stuff is is completely out of left field, like the um, Filecoin uh, game, which is cool. I think it was inspired by Dig Dug um, in terms of its color scheme, but the first one. Hey. Was kind of is that right? Wait, like, was, I, I have a I have a portable dig dug game like nice. right here. <laughs> that was, that was uh, Alan and I having fun. Well, it, I I chose the like gold, silver, and bronze color, and then Alan went and delivered the entire thing. It it it, it is yeah. I mean, I I feel very, you know, I get in the gaming mindset when I do that, so it's totally spot on. Um, 
and the first artifact there would, would be like just a simple style sheet, which Agatha um, started and just iterating on that and trying to simplify it a little and not not get too crazy with it because I want to put it out there and like apply this to something that exists, you know, because uh, working in the abstract for design just you know doesn't work. <laughs> Um, and so then, you know, apply it maybe to something that already exists um, so that I can see, well, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And, oh, they did this and then I actually, it's not represented here. So, you know, evolving it and uh, and then moving on to, yeah, uh, structuring some kind of a, a reference in whatever, you know, whatever the best format might be. Um, and I am inclined to make it as, you know, as digital and interactive as possible, as opposed to, you know, or in addition to stuff that a print that might, you know, benefit printers, you know, like a PDF or whatever. Um, but since the lion's share of what's being made around here is uh, interface based, you know, if, if there's um, a resource where, you know, folks can just tap to copy a snippet and, and paste it into their code. I think that could go a long way, uh, but not much progress there yet per se. Um, oh, a uh, <laughs> just a random, sorry, you know, poking down on a couple random things, branding type things like a uh, kind of title cards for for uh, IDM progress. Man, uh, IDM identity manager progress report meetings, um, and uh, and you know interface bits such as uh, you know just annoying little chime-ins for uh, desktop companions and things like that, and hopefully that you know IPFS is is actually you know what I technically am <laughs> assigned to. That's what uh, is. The, the tattoo in the back of my neck that I got on parts part of orientation says, and so uh, that will be my priority and one of my, you know, so the, it, there is a brand book for that now, um, you know, a V1 or 0 0.1 or whatever. And um, this week I'm going to take a look at, at, uh, at iterating on that and then think, and also thinking about how that could be made interactive to what other uh and, and what bits of it might be added that aren't there now super cool that's great thank you very much um uh anyone else who is present on the call who would like to share a thing we've reached the end of the uh people who filled out the agenda has anyone got anything else they want to share highlights from last week uh, stony silence. Sure. <laughs> um, I'm IPF Zoom number one. <laughs> Hi, so, IPF Zoom one. I have a question based on um, what I've been working on with Alert Bar. Um, I'm glad Alan is here. He's part of his call. So the bar um, on my machine, this is one of those works on my machine cases where the bar shows up two hours before the call and it remains for the half an hour of the IPFS call. Um, there was a suggestion to create a test and that is what I've been working on. And I'm wondering like if my approach is correct. So what I'm doing now is looking for the issue here and I'll start sharing my screen. Oops. Um, give me a moment. Do you see the GitHub issue? Mm, no, we see. Oh, we do now. Yeah. Okay. Um. So here is the conversation where it says, I think you need to add some test here. This sure. will still have a banner while the call is in progress. I didn't know how to go about the test. So this is what I, I've been looking at Mocha and Chai. 
And I am not sure, like, logically, what would be the best way to test that the bar is, uh, is appears for two and a half hours, or even if that's something that I should test or I should, like, change my logic. So this is what I have. And once again, the only thing this test asserts is if the logic of the start time is true or not, which is not helpful in terms of showing if the bar is up for two and a half hours. I think, um, I think it's probably best to dig into this after the call. Okay. Um, we use Mocker and Chai on all the other JavaScript projects, so that is a reasonable choice of testing library. Um, you, you, I think your big challenge is going to be you're going to need to mock out the date built in to do any kind of test that can meaningfully assert that things happen at certain times. You don't want to write a test that you can only run, <laughs> you have to run on a, a schedule. Um, yeah. anyway, but I think um, rather than trying to dig into that on this call, unless anyone's like, oh, I've done this before and I'm going to fix this live on camera. Uh, oh, I just wanted to show like if anyone yeah. had any like broad suggestions, like the fact that Mocha and Chai is like, that's the right direction is mm -hmm. useful for me. And if so, anyone else has some broad, useful like tips, then that would be more than appreciated. Super good. Um, all right. And we, I will I, stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, we can we can dig into that after the call. Um, Why debugging go? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyone else got anything they want to share? Alan and Chris, you're on the call. You want you got anything you want to share? I can share. Thanks. Cool. Uh, I've got words rather than visuals. Oh, they better be good ones. Okay. Um, well, Hack Diaz, Enrique, you might know him, uh, helped out and uh, did a pull request to the module Go IPFS depth, uh, which actually removes uh, a whole bunch of hard coded version numbers and uh, platforms and architectures from it. Uh, and instead, when you install Go IPFS Dep, it asks the site where it gets uh, the actual uh, IPFS dependency from, uh, which has a special JSON file which lists out all of the architectures, platforms, uh, and versions. Uh, well, no, it doesn't list out versions, but all of those things. Um, it asks a site for that information rather than having it duplicated in the module. So that was really cool. Um, and so now when you install go IPFS depth, which I've just released 0 0.4.19, um, to go go with the new go IPFS release, um, it will, instead of using its hard coded values, it will now ask the, um, the, the dist.ipfs.io website for that information, which is super cool. So, um, he helped update it to the new version and also, uh, made it better at the same time. So hooray for that. Um, so thank you, Henrik. You are not here, but you are in our hearts always. Uh, so other than that, I've been working on trying to get um, IP, JS IPFS 035 out the door. You may or may not know that the big news is that a DHT is coming, and it is uh, it's really close. <laughs> um, it, th we've had some stability issues that we've only run into once everything got merged into um, into the master because it, they only all of our tests and our interop tests sort of like they spin up a node or another node or two nodes check that things can get um, d uh, exchanged between them and then they're like okay that's great spin down uh, and and same thing for interop tests and, and uh, but that doesn't tell us things like when your node is running for like. 10 minutes and acquires a thousand peers will it still be running <laughs> because it's run not run out of memory uh, or uh, or things like that so um we've been kind of battling with that and we what's what we found is that we haven't been um counting our well uh we fire an event for like when a peer is connected or disconnected and that wasn't being um, counted properly. So the connection manager, the thing that sort of manages the number of connections that are allowed, uh, wasn't able to actually do any of that work. So, so that was no good. And then a bunch of other kind of things that we've, that have kind of cropped up, um, that we've been, um, been working on, but 
uh, Hugo has uh, fixed up the uh, the problem with the we had a problem where uh, the CPU was pegged at 100 percent and um, it was uh, the problem with that is that the lock file implementation was trying to update the kind of modify time on the lock lock file but it didn't the because the event loop was being uh, it was being used the whole time it didn't get to do it in time uh, for it to not consider the lock file to be like invalid so that was so it yeah, the, basically, the node was doing lots of work and then bringing itself down by by sort of saying, "Oh no, <laughs> die." Uh, so yeah. Anyway, that issue has been fixed, so that's good. Just stuff like that has just kind of cropped up that we didn't really expect. So um, I'm pleased to say that now we are very close to having we have a node that um, runs uh, and will run for a long time and um, doesn't use up 100% of your CPU and uh, you can disable preloading um, and still access content that the node doesn't have lo locally via the, the magic of the DHT so um, it's really beautiful to see in real life um, if you're a nerd like me <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it, it should be coming out really soon. I've just got, um, we've got some interop issues with 0.4.19 that I need to iron out now before we can get the release uh, out the door. But uh, it's it's nearly there. So hooray! Hooray! Words. We, uh, we've got a uh, web UI 2.4.1 release for you with the now, yeah, now approved analytics menu. Poke it in! Okay, in. Absolutely. Um, Chris, did you want to go? Yeah, very quickly. My, my one more thing for this week is uh, I, uh, I say for last week, I started on the, the kind of shared merge component library. Uh, I have a very uh, basic app framework written, written up for that, which I will continue after this week, because this week I'm currently in very wintry wonderland of Chamonix, um, working on all the IPFS cam powering. So trying to get the schedule done, um, uh, getting all the, the content done for the website. And also we've been doing some um, essentially brainstorming around uh, how the sessions will work and all the, all the event will come together. So um, some practical releases this week on the similar vein of the analytics has been very careful about how we're managing and processing data. So there's been a lot of toing and froing with legal, um, making sure we've uh, very carefully handcrafted a data policy um, so that it fits our external events and how we will deal with data. Um, also collection um, and migrating of contacts so we can uh, direct information to them directly. Um, so that's all come together. We've uh, we've we've got our, uh, our mailing list out and announced this uh, this afternoon. That's already gone. Um, and we'll continue to work on uh, iterating the website for basically a release next week, I, I think. Um, so that's essentially my update in the IPFS land. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll, I'm sure I'll be uh, sharing more details with you all very soon. But uh, looking forward to our team week so we can actually all get together and set those Q2 priorities. Super cool. Um, for those that don't know, the IPFS GUI team, in web browsers team, and package managers teams are going to meet up in Lisbon in a couple of weeks. Um, in a couple of weeks. in. 10 days, yeah, who knows, soon, um, to retrospect on this quarter and to make our plans for Q2, and also to do some work in the same room and to hack on some fun experiments. It's gonna be great. Um, oh, Eric, question. Can I ask uh, others who are going to be there to do what I'm doing now so I will know who I'm gonna see? <laughs> Oh wow! Awesome. Oh, uh, <laughs> portion Terry. So this is I missed, a classic. I missed what we were raising our hands about. I'm sorry. This is the classic. Like I, I was proposing a like four person IPFS GUI team gathering, and it's now like gradually expanding. Um, anywho, oh, the, the, we're going to meet up in Lisbon in, in a couple of weeks to plan our Q2 stuff. Um, yeah. Any more for any more? Um, Lyle, we've got five minutes on the clock and you were going to give us a an update about Brave. And that would be a lovely way to finish the call. Yeah, so I think it will be exciting, especially if, given the update about DHT from Alan. So uh, I sort of uh, 
uh, solved all, I think I've solved all the polyfill issues around uh, sockets uh, from uh, Chrome APIs, like those advanced uh, APIs for the, the row access to the sockets. And what that means, is we should be able to uh, to expose that gateway finally <laughs> from JSAPFS. Uh, need to add some wiring. And uh, what's exciting is that there will be a new release window for Brave within next three weeks. And I had a call with uh, CTO of Brave today and we should be able to squeeze a small change to Brave to whitelist uh, our uh, extension IDs. So that right now uh, the, we've been uh, whitelisted in a feature branch, but it should be fairly safe to basically whitelist it in the stable channel of Brave. And that would enable us to basically iterate uh, our extension against regular Brave build without like need for lo locally building everything. Unless we of course need to change something in Brave, but I feel for, for this phase of iteration, this will be highly beneficial. So I plan to, I plan to allocate uh, more, a little bit more time to that effort in the following weeks, just to push this uh, towards a finish line and to see how we can uh, distribute uh, a special build of our extension uh, within the orchestration around web extension that Brave built. Uh, so when the Brave user uh, goes to Chrome Web Store and clicks install, they will get the Brave more powerful version. And another idea is to have uh, an option in preferences of Brave. Basically there's like position for web torrent and there's a toggle switch just to enable it and the extension is installed from the preferences screen. So basically we should be able to have something similar uh, sooner or later for IPFS. So that's uh, I feel that's a good uh, UI for you. Like, that's a UX win for user. The user does not need uh, to go and look for extension and decide which is the official one. It will just be there, enable IPFS support in your browser and that's it. So that's like a quick update on mine. Is there anything we can see? Have you got, is it running? It is, but... Uh, in the console, so it's not very visual. And I don't have it on this laptop, <laughs> but maybe next week. A browser operating as a server. That sounds peer-to-peer -to, -peer to me. All right, there's two minutes left on the clock. Any other business? Got any gossip? Heard, any, heard anything from some other calls that you sh we should know? Would you like 60 seconds of your lives back for more excitement? Debugging, distributing the web? Yes, your silence is compliance. This has been the IPFS Weekly in Web Browsers and I go his GUI team sync up call. See you same time, same place next week. Hooray!